people independently verify. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, this uh, this talk is a follow-on to uh, George's to George's uh, presentation. Uh, this work is uh, based on uh, two papers that appeared uh, just last year in the Monthly Weather Review. The first one, and that's what uh, George just talked about. Uh, the second one is uh, the, the one I'm going to talk about now. They're both. I don't have the complete references, but they're available on a on a website near you. And if you have your laptop open, it's very near you. So um, you, you can check you can check out what I say. Um, anyway, so uh, kind of picking up uh, where George left off, this is a uh, slide which shows the uh, in the red line the uh, maximum wind as determined from this uh, hurricane uh, simulation, axisymmetric hurricane simulation, and all the particulars were described uh, in the previous talk. Uh, the dash curve is a uh, is the manual potential intensity. That's the theoretical estimate uh, in this uh, well-known paper by Kerry Manuel, 1986. Um, in the in the magenta box uh, is the uh, the the famous uh, potential intensity formula, uh, giving the Vmax uh, uh, maximum uh, potential uh, for a hurricane in terms of this ratio of the uh, enthalpy to the drag coefficients, difference between the sea surface temperature and the outflow temperature. And importantly here, the difference between the uh, saturated uh, entropy at the sea surface minus the entropy in the air in the boundary layer um, just above the sea surface, all evaluated at the radius of maximum wind. Now, this formula is, uh, is basically, it's, it's not a closed formula in the sense that uh, you don't know the, uh, the right-hand side any better than you know the left-hand side. The right-hand side uh, depends on the solution, just like the left-hand side. So this is the entropy, potential temperature, depends on pressure and temperature, things, things you don't know a priori. You would have to go to and do further developments, make further approximations in order to relate uh, Vmax to something you know a priori. However, it's, uh, you know, to the extent that the uh, formula verifies, it tells you that you know something about um, the atmosphere, uh, that is to say, the things that you, uh, you assume to develop the model, you can assume to be true if the formula verifies. Now, what we see here is that uh, as you vary this uh, L sub H parameter, uh, in this range over here, the formula happened to verify. Uh, but in going to smaller L sub H's, there is a, uh, a significant uh, underestimation of the uh, maximum winds uh, of the theory as compared to the model. So the uh, subject of this talk is uh, how can we can uh, explain the difference between the theory and the model? What, what explains this difference? So uh, just to, uh, to, to give you a more, uh, a more visual impression of what, uh, what goes, uh, what's different between theory and model, this is the, uh, the, uh, the larger L sub H simulation. Gives you a, uh, a vortex as here is depicted in radial vertical space with these colors indicating uh, uh, the azimuthal wind. As you go from 3,000 meters to 750 meters, you notice a, a remarkable change in the intensity and the structure of the vortex. Okay, so we'd like to explain that. So uh, I don't want to hear a lot of groaning, but we have to talk about an equation. And this is the, uh, basically the equation uh, that is the starting point for developing of the manual potential intensity theory. Uh, just by way of uh, history, I first saw this equation in an old uh, manuscript of Doug Lilly's. Uh, it uh, was one of these things that still had lined a notebook paper on it, and uh, he had this equation uh, written down. It's a form of uh, Long's equation. It's more general than Long's equation. Uh, those of you who work in uh, mountain wave dynamics will, will know Long's equation. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's especially uh, something that uh, used for uh, steady state uh, theory. Uh, and uh, theories in which there's some sorts of symmetry. In mountain waves, it's two-dimensional. Here, it's axisymmetric. So uh, if you want further information on that, I suggest the, uh, the book by CSE, Dynamics of Non-Homogeneous Fluids. It's, it's still a classic, and it has the history. The, the original paper by Long makes references to even earlier, uh, earlier derivations, but uh, in those earlier derivations, they hadn't figured out how to apply it to anything. So anyway, the long rightly gets credit for this equation. It's basically if you throw out the angular momentum terms, you have long's equation. Uh, it has also been applied to rotating flows. If you throw out basically the, the entropy term, 
uh, you have the equation for rotating flows. But this uh, combination of uh, both rotating stratified flows, this is in Doug Lilly's article. And uh, so anyway, so basically all it is is the, it's the momentum equations in the RZ plane projected onto a line. So if you take the dot product of the RZ momentum equations onto an arbitrary line, uh, you'll get this equation. Okay. Uh, the angle momentum is at M, uh, the entropy is S, and uh, basically in the, in the total energy, which is basically the moist static energy in this case, plus the kinetic energy per unit mass. Uh, these things here are, uh, are, are basically, since we've assumed inviscid adiab uh, adiabatic, pseudo-adiabatic flow above the boundary layer, these things are both function of the stream function. Uh, so uh, we have here, if you, if, if you know these things uh, along a, uh, a stream function line, they just become numbers that, uh, that are inv invariant along those lines. So the first thing you do, you can find this in Doug Lilly's paper, if you take R to infinity, these, two first, these first two terms drop, and you say, okay, well, let's imagine we're going in the outflow of a hurricane. Those first two, first two terms go away. The only thing that changes then is that the temperature becomes the outflow temperature. Subtract this from this and reduce the equation considerably to that. Uh, and in particular, we're interested in the, uh, in the maximum wind, so we're going to apply that equation to the, uh, the radius of maximum wind. So this is simply uh, specifying, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, consider this equation at the uh, radius of maximum wind, at the height of maximum wind, where x uh, marks the spot. Uh, the uh, non-gradient wind effects and non-hydrostatic effects live in this term, and if we throw away that term, get that to zero, and finally, uh, with that, we can, we can uh, get rid of the, the psi, just multiply through by uh, the psi dm, and we have this uh, relatively simple form here. To, uh, to close the equation, you know, again, just to keep, keep, keep track of what we've done, We've assumed the adiabatic inviscid flow. That gives us that M and, and S are both functions of stream function. We've assumed gradient wind balance in that last step, got a zero there. We need to hit a relationship between S and M. And this is this last assumption of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of relating the variation of S with M across this point uh, to, the, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the boundary layer. And this is I, in my opinion, the most ingenious step of the whole uh, derivation is in, uh, is in coming up with this closure for uh, ds uh, dm, the variation of s for them. Anyway, if you uh, take this, plug it into here, you'll come up with the uh, celebrated uh, formula. So uh, what goes wrong with the formula? Well, what, what's different about numerical model simulations and the formula? So we're going to examine a numerical simulation, one that significantly exceeds, whose Vmax significantly exceeds the formula, and uh, check off the assumptions one by one. So the first uh, assumption is, uh, this is generally referred to as moist plant-wise neutrality, but it's a, simply a uh, consequence of having assumed uh, inviscid adiabatic flow. Both S and M are functions of stream function, so you have two functions that are a function of the a third function. They're functions of each other. So S is a, is a function of M is the thing to be checked. So let's check that out. Here's a, this is the solution for 750 meter L sub H following a streamline in through the radius of maximum wind and up and away through the storm. These are the theta E surfaces or the S, otherwise known as S. And this is the M surfaces. And as you can see, to a high degree of, uh, of uh, there's a high degree of congruence of these uh, surfaces with these, uh, with these stream surfaces, the stream surface, an M surface, and a theta E surface, there's a high degree of congruence. This is not the, di this is not the cause of the uh, discrepancy between theory and, uh, and model. Uh, the second thing was the P PBL model. This is uh, one of the things that uh, we're suspecting, well, perhaps this thing goes wrong in some uh, bad way. So what we did uh, from that same simulation, the one that exceeds, or Vmax exceeds the theory, is simply uh, independently estimate the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And as you can see, they track each other uh, rather well. Uh, the difference is actually flip sign over here. This would actually make uh, too weak a cyclone on the, uh, the left-hand, uh, to the left of this, uh, this L sub H here. 
But in any event, these differences are, no, are nowhere near enough to explain the difference between the VMAX theory and VMAX uh, of the model. The last, uh, so we can check off then these two and now evaluate the last, um, the last uh, approximate, last major approximation of the theory, and that is the, uh, uh, the gradient wind approximation. And uh, here we have in the first, uh, uh, the first uh, image, the uh, V back from uh, a, the, the azimuthal wind field from a radial vertical uh, distribution. Here's that trajectory coming through. The dot marks the uh, spot of the maximum wind, comes and oscillates its way out the top. Uh, this uh, the second one here is the gradient wind, and the bottom one is the difference between V and VG. And as you can see, there's a significant departure, and maybe you can't see, something like a 20 meter per second uh, departure between gradient wind and, uh, and the Vmax of the model. So, of course, uh, the, um, you know, having made, uh, having made the uh, gradient wind assumption in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, in the manual model, the manual model is predicting the, the maximum gradient wind. So, um, basically, the, the, the thing that uh, is different is the, uh, is the existence of significant uh, non-gradient wind effects in the, uh, in the uh, actual solution. Now, this, these, go, these ideas go back a long, long way. This is from my, my old uh, copy of Schlitling's uh, book, the Lam uh, Boundary Layer Theory, 1968. And, and these general solutions go back to... Oh, Back as far as 1940, this is the known as the Vodawatt solution. This is a uh, a, uh, so, a flow that's in solid body rotation on a on a stationary disk, and uh, you can come up with similarity solutions uh, indicated here on the right. There's a radial inflow coming in down below. Uh, it obviously comes in, overshoots. As it overshoots, it comes out, it brings angular momentum momentum in further than it would have otherwise done had there been no boundary layer. So you get an overshoot in the V something on the order of 26%. And, uh, yeah, and uh, so it, uh, basically this, this type of flow we've known for a long time. This, is, this goes back to, you know, at least as far as the 60s when there were people, when, uh, you know, people like Greg Holland and me were wearing uh, you know, bell bottoms and Nehru jackets. Uh, people, people knew about this stuff. You had <laughs> I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so uh, just to, uh, again, in the spirit of, you know, say if you, if, uh, just uh, adding the extra effect that was left out of the Emanuel uh, theory and doing, redoing the evaluation, this is the, uh, the non-gradient wind effect, again, evaluated from the model, added back into the estimate from the Emanuel formula, and that's the green line here. And indeed, I think we've identified, you know, the source of the discrepancy between the uh, between the uh, the Emanuel model, based, which is basically a model for the maximum gradient wind, and the numerical model simulations in this range where there is a low mixing. So, um, in conclusion, we basically uh, checked out these three uh, components: uh, moist uh, slant-wise neutrality doesn't seem to be an issue. The PBL model doesn't seem to be an issue. The main issue is the departure from gradient wind balance uh, in the numerical model. Now that's not to say that the numerical is right or, or wrong, or, it, it, or let me say it. that's not to say that the numerical model is closer to nature. Uh, in nature, we don't know what these uh, know what the the effects of horizontal diffusion uh, are. Uh, what we do know from this study is that the simulated uh, tropical cyclone, the simulated Vmax is bigger than the than the theoretical upper limit in cases where there's weak horizontal diffusion, and the weak horizontal diffusion seems to uh, give rise to a violation of gradient wind. And so uh, basically we have uh, the situation here where two, two assumptions seem to have uh, canceled each other out. So the, the theory was inviscid, and the inviscid theory basically makes something too strong. The gradient wind approximation makes it too weak. Add them up, and you get a wash. So that, that seems to be the, uh, the explanation here. The, the, the challenge for the uh, forecasting and for this group as uh, George uh, addressed in his uh, lecture, we don't, we don't know from observations uh, or theory what horizontal diffusion effects should be. What, what, are, what are the mixing effects, uh, the horizontal mixing effects in the tropical cyclone? And uh, we, all, we only have a limited data set on non-gradient wind effects. So these things are basically uh, unknown. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll close.